right. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for taking your time today to join us in this webinar, Safe Minds, Safe Work, Addressing Psychosocial Hazards in the Workplace. Psychosocial hazards include elements of a work environment, management practices, or organizational practices that threaten mental health and well-being. Under Occupational Health and Safety Law, which we'll refer to as OHS, employers must identify and eliminate, or if elimination is not reasonably practical, control, workplace hazards, which may include physical and psychosocial hazards. This event today is brought to you by the Ministry of Jobs, Economy, and Trade. I'm Catherine Lanier, an Effective Practices Consultant with the Strategic Evidence and Action Team. This team develops externally facing information resources that enables employers, workers, and other worksite parties to improve awareness, education, and the ability to take positive OHS actions that support a culture of health and safety in the province and supports the prevention of workplace illness and injury. Yordanka is a registered psychologist with over 18 years of experience in psychotherapy and organizational psychology. She has created and implemented psychological well-being strategies targeted at companies with diverse and complex workforce demographics. During her time as a mental health specialist in the Canadian energy sector, she developed an award-winning mental health training program for leaders in the workplace. Her passion lies in bringing the elements of human psychology and wellness into the workplace, creating strong and resourceful employees and organizations. She is an, currently an occupational mental health specialist for the Ministry of Jobs, Economy and Trade, and is also currently researching the effectiveness of organizational mindfulness. Before we dive into the presentation, I'd like to explain how to use the chat and question and answer features. At the top of your screen, you'll see options for both. Uh, Q&A is the question and answer piece. The chat will be used to, for us to share some links at the end and some resources and post poll results, while the Q&A is where we invite you to submit any questions you may have, and we will address those at the end of this session. Uh, we do recommend putting your questions into the Q&A and not the chat, just because the chat might get loaded up with some poll questions and we might miss your question, but we'll do our best to take a look. All right, we hope you find today's session valuable, and we encourage you to participate by engaging with the polls and sharing your questions. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples presently subject to the treaties six, seven, and eight, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Tsutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. This includes the Métis settlements and the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on, play on, or are visiting. Land acknowledgements have been adopted as a common practice in civic and community spaces across Canada as a small but important step towards reconciliation. We acknowledge the land as an Indigenous protocol used to express gratitude to those who reside here and to honour the Indigenous peoples who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. We also have a quick disclaimer and copyright notice to guide our presentation in the event that any there's any discrepancy between the information that your Dank or I present and the OHS legislation, the legislation is always considered correct. So, as we said in this webinar, we'll be providing an overview of psychosocial hazards in the workplace, workplace incident statistics, and free resources to help workers and employers control psychosocial hazards at their workplace. You are going to see a poll question popping up on the screen. Your response will be anonymous, but we just wanted to get a general sense of our audience. So in your opinion, are there uncontrolled psychosocial hazards in your workplace? Yes, no, or not sure. I will just give us another second for folks to pop in. Oh, are other people able to hear me? I see some people in the chat who are saying that they don't have sound. Uh, Jordanka, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I'm able to hear you, Catherine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they might just need to, they might need to leave and come back. So I will mm -hmm. pop in and change that. So looks like about 70 people say that, yes, there are 
uncontrolled psychosocial hazards in their workplace. So thank you for that feedback. And I'm going to pass this to Yordanka for the next couple slides. Okay. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I'm wondering whether some of you are wondering what are even psychosocial hazards. <laughs> so hopefully we can cover that information for you as we progress through the presentation. Uh, but um, I think just looking at that poll response, it's evident that a lot of workplaces are still trying to figure out how do they identify psychosocial hazards, what are psychosocial hazards, how do we effectively control them in the workplace. Um, and for me, one of the things that it has been quite a steep learning curve coming into the government of Alberta is actually looking at the uh, OHS Act uh, and the provisions that are in that act for psychosocial hazards. Um, so the Occupational Health and Safety or the OHS legislation makes it clear that workers' mental and physical health must be protected. Um, so in the OHS Act, one of the stated purposes of the act is the promotion and maintenance of the highest degree of physical psychological and social well-being of workers. I think this is really important no matter what position you hold in the company, whether it's leadership, whether you're coming to us from HR and joining this webinar, whether that you're a worker, but knowing that there's provision actually in the OHS legislation in Alberta that does specifically address the psychological well-being of workers in the workplace. And in addition, part one of the general obligations of employers states that every employer shall ensure as far as it is reasonably practicable, practicable for the employer to do so, the health, safety and welfare of workers engaged in the work of that employer, uh, those workers not engaged in the work of that employer, but present at the work site uh, at which that work is being carried out and other persons at or in the vicinity of the work site whose health and safety may be materially affected by identifiable and controllable hazards originating from the work site. Um, so again, this is giving you a background from that legislative piece, um, and especially if you're a professional um, in safety in OHNS, knowing that they are particular regulations that align with the Alberta legislature that require employers to actually provide psychologically um, safe work spaces for people at the work site and around their work site. So then moving on to talk about what is a psychologically health and safe workplace. You might have heard the term psychological safety being thrown around or psychosocial hazards, but what does th those actually mean? Um, so the National Standard of Canada for Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace defines psychological health and safety as the absence of harm and or threat of harm to one till mal to mental well-being that a worker might experience. And for those of you familiar with the CSA standards, they have also outlined 13 particular factors uh, that are tied to a psychologically safe workplace. I won't list all 13 of them. Those are pretty easy for you to find uh, out there as information, but just to give you some examples. So a few of those, one of the factors is organizational culture. Another one is psychological demands. Another one is recognition and reward. Um, so there's 13 of these factors and companies can actually use those as a guide to figure out what psychosocial hazards might be present. They can use those to measure the level of psychological safety in their workplace. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that, especially if we're talking about larger uh, organizations, psychological safety can vary between teams, uh, between locations. So it's not a size, one size fits all. Um, this is an area of work where really employers have to look at the particular um, challenges that they may have as an organization in terms of culture, in terms of their workforce. Uh, so it's definitely not all psychosocial hazards will be present in all type of industries. 
What we do know is that some of the most challenging industries um, and types of work for psychosocial hazards are, for example, those types of occupations that have high demand. So they're quite stressful, but there's very low control. So workers don't have a lot of autonomy in the hours that they work, in how they do their work. So that could be very stressful if there's very, very low worker control and autonomy. Uh, and there's very high demands in terms of what they need to do as um, an employee. And from the lens of psychological safety, I know that there's also many of you, I know some of you on the call, we've actually done work together in the space of psychological safety. And there's also the work that's been done by Amy Amundsen uh, from um, Harvard, and they have talked about psychological safety from a team perspective. So you may have heard the definition that psychological safety is a team as a team is about that shared belief that team members can take interpersonal risks uh, and they feel safe to actually be themselves within a team. And one of the things that I always talk about when we're trying to define what is a psychological health and safety in the workplace, it's not that everybody gets along. That's not what it's about. It's a workplace. People are going to have different personalities. People are going to have different opinions, but psychologically health and safety workplaces are about how do we address those differences in a respectful manner, and how do we show up every day being respectful to the people that we work with. So that's a big part of it, but it's definitely not about um, getting along with everyone uh, that um, that you work with. Um, and then why um, why even address psychologically safe? workplaces. Why is this something that is important? We know, as I stated at the beginning of my presentation, that this is something that is in the legislation. So there is the um, legal requirement to address, but why has this even made it to the point where we're talking about psychological safety in the workplace? Um, and the reality of it is that psychologically health and safety workplaces offer many benefits, uh, and uh, they can range from having more productive workers to people actually feeling better psychologically and physically. And I'll go through these reasons more in detail about the health, the legal, the financial benefits. Um, and uh, I'll probably, I guess the easiest for me would just be to break them down. So for example, let's look at health benefits first. Um, so there's a link between psychological and physical health, and that's been recognized for decades. Um, sometimes when people are struggling with physical elements, they will also show up as psychological issues and vice versa. Some research suggests people with anxiety or depression are much more likely to develop a long-term medical condition. Many jobs require workers to have good concentration and awareness of their surroundings in order to be safe. Uh, so this concentration and awareness can be affected by poor psychological health. So having people that are feeling psychologically healthy and safe in the workplace is important because it directly ties to the physical safety of those workers. Um, I I know that with my work that I have done in the energy sector, a lot of the times when I would talk to people after incidents occurred, uh, a lot of the incidents would be tied back to a combination of factors that contributed to physical, but also psychological demands. So for example, fatigue or somebody that was dealing with personal issues and then they showed up to work. Um, so things like that. So we know that there's a tie between the psychological and the physical well-being of people. The legal aspect, of course, I already covered that under Alberta OHS law, employers are required to assess their work sites to identify existing and potential hazards. This may include physical hazards, but also mental hazards, which are known as psychosocial hazards, depending on the workplace. And this requirement aligns with the OHS Act's stated purpose, which again is to promote and maintain the highest degree of physical and psychological and social well being of workers. And then we go into the financial aspect, and this is really important if you're somebody that is trying to get some buy-in from your leadership as an organization about why 
outside from the legal, of course, ramifications uh, of needing to address this. But why is it important to have healthy and safe workers? Uh, well, it pays to do so because when you are addressing psychological safety, when you're providing a workplace where people actually want to be a part of, you're going to have more productive workers. The performance of workers increases, job morale and satisfaction increase as well. And as an organization, you're less likely to have to have high rates of turnover, interpersonal conflicts, and also lower disability claims and WCB claims that are tied to mental health. So hopefully all of this is painting you a picture of why it's important to not only look at the physical aspects of safety, but also at the psychological aspects of safety. As a psychologist, there's um, one parallel that I make between psychological safety at workplaces and the safety that we experience in our interpersonal relationships. Uh, so before I started doing organizational psychology, I would do a therapy and I work with many, many couples and couples would come into my office and they would talk about problems such as they weren't talking to each other anymore. They weren't spending any time together. Uh, they weren't being intimate and when you broke that down and looked at really the foundational issues, there was a lack of safety in the relationship. Most of the time, these partners were not able to be themselves around each other. They weren't spending quality time around each other because they wouldn't feel comfortable saying what they actually thought. They felt judged, they felt pressured, there was a lot of expectations and stress. And that really, even though it's a personal relationship, when we look at the organizational aspect of it, it's really parallel. We're not going to have productive people that are happy in their work relationships unless we have that base of psychological safety where people feel that they can actually come to work and they are not threatened by psychosocial hazards. So that's a parallel that I always make between these, that that sense of safety is really important in our interpersonal as well as our work relationships. There's really not a big difference in, in those two. So when we talk about uh, workplace hazards, many of you are familiar with assessing and controlling workplace hazards, uh, but we also wanted to do a brief, deep, uh, brief refresher and overview. Uh, if you do need more information, we have a free hazard assessment and control ha handbook on our OHS resource portal, which we will talk about later. Alberta's occupational health and safety laws require employers to conduct hazard assessments and to eliminate the identified hazards. If they cannot be eliminated, the employer must introduce controls to protect against these hazards. Uh, there are four types of workplace hazards. You have your physical hazards, so these can include equipment, machinery and tools, and workspaces with, for example, very hot or cold temperatures, um, and then you can have biological hazards as well. So these can include bacteria, viruses, insects, mold, plant materials. Chemical hazards are those that includes vapors, gases, dust, fumes and chemical mists, and your psychosocial hazards can include workplace harassment, violence, working conditions, stress, and impairment, uh, to name a few. Uh, so these are the type of hazards that you can um, come across in any type of workplace, and this is the type of hazards that you must assess and provide controls for as an employer. And I think at this time, Catherine, you have uh, another poll for our listeners. Yes, so we have two poll questions to kind of little skill twist testing questions. The first one is if a worker is complaining of headaches, tiredness and sore eyes, a delivery vehicle is I delivery vehicles idle by event that draws air into the building. What type of hazard is this? Is this a physical hazard, a biological hazard, a chemical hazard, a psychosocial hazard or not a hazard? So I'll pop that in and give you all a couple seconds to respond to that. All right, majority of people are saying it's a chemical hazard. Yes, that is a chemical hazard. Now, we have one more full question in this area. So this is, a crew leader yells at a new worker and the worker is uncomfortable returning to work the next day. Is this a physical hazard, a biological hazard, a chemical hazard, a psychosocial hazard, or not a hazard? What do folks think? All 
right. So far, everybody is putting a psychosocial hazard. Excellent. Yes, that is a psychosocial hazard. All right. And we will go back to your Danka for the next piece. Thanks. Great. Thanks for that, Catherine. Um, so the next piece is about these hazard controls and how do we actually control for them in the workplace? Uh, now, there's sort of these four things that you can do going from elimination to engineering control to administer controls and to personal protective equipment. Um, and as you can imagine, these can be a challenge when we're talking about psychosocial hazards because sometimes they're not black and white and there's a little bit of a gray area and it takes a little bit more thinking about how do you address a particular psychosocial um, hazard. Now, you must remove the hazard if it's reasonably practical to do so. So the first step is elimination. If you're looking at hazards in the workplace, uh, if possible, if you can, for example, remove the hazard, that's really your best step. But this can be very difficult to do if we're talking about psychosocial hazards. Uh, but for example, sometimes, and this is where I talk about it being a gray area, think about a workplace where there's really harsh lighting for example, and that may be something that is a physical hazard. Uh, it may be blinding people, but then what if it's also just so harsh that it's making it then be a bit on edge? It's stressing them out. So the lighting, even though it's not um, something that we may technically think of as a psychosocial hazard could be a psychosocial hazard uh, because it's affecting people's well-being. Same with noises as well. Um, so one example I'll give you, my mom work, works in a construction company uh, and for a long time they had the policy that everybody could bring their radio and listen to whatever they wanted to listen to, any type of music. What that created is that you would have 10 people at a work site all listening to different music. And she talked about the fact that this really interfered with her mental health. She said, your dad, I can't even work because I'm feeling so on edge because of all of this music. Um, so with something like this, what can you do? Can you eliminate the noise? Can you eliminate the lighting? Um, so this is your first step in the hazards control. Now, if you cannot remove the hazard, then there are control options with engineering controls being the most effective, followed by administrative controls and personal protective equipment. So engineering controls isolate people from the hazard. This controls the hazard at its source. Uh, so examples could include physical barriers to protect the workers uh, if they're working alone, uh, using equipment guards, using a forklift to lift heavy loads or ensuring proper ventilation. And then administrative controls change the way that people work. When elimination isn't an option and engineered controls are not feasible, employers are expected to do what they can to introduce controls that change the way that people work. This could include developing safe work practices and procedures, providing training and supervision for workers and leaders, uh, limiting exposure time by rotating jobs or displaying warning signs. So changing the way that people work um, in my experience, I find that this is where a lot of the um, control for psychosocial hazards happen because this is where employers can actually introduce policies that train people, for example, on mental health or on psychologically safe workplaces. They can, if one of their hazards is, for example, um, civility and respect, they can have training on that. Um, so this is where you may see a lot of those uh, psychosocial hazards uh, controls is in the administrative part. Uh, or if they're dealing, for example, with a fly-in, fly-out role, changing the rotation of the fly-in, when the flights are, all those types of things could be example of administrative controls. Uh, and then the last one, personal protective equipment. Um, this is worn by the worker to protect them. It's introduced only if the hazard cannot be eliminated and after engineering and administrative controls are found to be unworkable for specific hazards. Um, so, you know, examples would be footwear, safety glasses and so forth. Uh, now, really in this psychosocial hazards, I don't think there's a lot of personal protective equipment uh, controls that um, I can think of. Uh, so it's really more so states within the engineering and the administrative control. 
controls, but by all means, if anybody can <laughs> can think of personal protective equipment for psychosocial hazards, do uh, do let me know. Um, and if, if the um, hazard cannot be eliminated or controlled by using a single control method, the employer may use a combination of engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Um, so this is what the hierarchy looks like and something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your workplace and how you can potentially address psychosocial hazards uh, through these hazards controls. Okay. Catherine, I will pass it on awesome. to you. Thanks for that, Yordanka. So the following slides, we're going to look at some workplace illness, injury, and fatality statistics based on workers' compensation claim data from Alberta in 2022. And I will throw some links into the, the chat for where you can find this information. And just to answer one of the questions I saw pop into the chat, we will be sending out a email after this to everybody who's registered for the webinar. It'll have some of the links and information that we went over. We will also do our best to include the recording. That might just be a bit delayed because we just have to make sure that it, uh, the recording gets approved and then we'll share the, the link for that afterwards. So for statistics, so in 2022, the Workers' Compensation Board of Alberta spent over 340 $45 million for more than 57,000 claims. And this does not include 120 fatalities that also occurred in this year. These claim costs and counts may increase as claims are fully processed. And the statistic only shows the amount paid by the Workers' Compensation Board, which does impact the premiums employers pay. But beyond that, we know that there's other costs that we don't measure, such as the cost of time required to investigate the incidents, training or hiring staff to replace workers who are on leave due to an injury, and other expenses to the employer. This also does not tell the story of the cost to the individuals and families who have been injured, ill, or who have died as a part of performing their work. I have a couple of definitions to review before we look at some of the data. Again, many of you may be familiar with these, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So first, a lost time claim is a claim that causes the worker to have time away from work beyond the day of the injury. A disabling injury claim is a claim that causes either time lost from work or for the worker's normal work duties to be modified. And finally, we tend to use injury rates to compare statistics instead of just the total number of injuries, because this, this better accounts for the number of workers, whether they're working full time, part time, casual. Uh, and so the injury rate can be looked at as a worker's risk of injury or illness if they worked during a one year period. For example, the lost time claim rate is the total number of lost time claims divided for every hundred person years worked. Uh, injury rate claim rates that are based on a small number of person years worked are too volatile to make comparisons over years or sorry over time. So claim rates are not calculated when there's fewer than 40 person years worked. And you'll be able to see more of information on this in the report on injuries and illnesses and fatalities that I will that I will post later on. So here are the workplace illness and injury rates over the past five years. You can see at the top that solid line is the disabling injury and illness claim. The modified work claim is in the middle and then the lost time claim is at the bottom. You can see an overall a slight decrease from 2018 to 2022. There were also 120 fatalities in 2022. Most were due to occupational illnesses and then about an even split between workplace incidents and motor vehicle incidents. In 2022, psychosocial hazards accounted for 2% of claims and harassment and violence accounted for 3% of claims. These percentages may seem small, but you have to consider that, again, there was over 57,000 claims, and this adds up to many affected Albertan workers. If we want to look at where these claims are coming from, the industry with the highest claim rate is cities, towns, and villages, which was 0.26 per 100 person years for their rate. The paramedical occupation had the most claims at 18%. Exposure to traumatic or stressful event was the most common incident category and made up 35% of incidents. Most common uh, types of uh, claims were anxiety or neurotic disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders, which were, so 35% were anxiety or neurotic disorders and 26% were post-traumatic stress disorders. 90%, or sorry, uh, uh, workers aged 25 to 34, four years old had the most claims, so this was 30%. And then, oh, my apologies, I jumped. 
screen, and male and female workers had 50% of claims each, so an equal amount of claims. Harassment and violence. And this harassment and violence we look at separately just because it's a bit easier to uh, to look at. It's often has is a claim that is more clear for the workers to submit and to get accepted. As many of us know, uh, psychological injury claims, we're still recognizing that these are work related and we're still working on, on people being able to tie these to their work and uh, report them. So whereas harassment and violence is often a little bit more of a clear cut situation and it makes it easier to to follow when the claims are submitted. So that's why we have a separate section on harassment and violence. So if we're looking at the what's causing the harassment and violent claims, uh, disability rehabilitation was the industry group with the highest claim rate, which was 0.49 for 100 person years. And the nurse aides, orderlies, and patient service associates was the occupation group with the most claims. So they had 17% of claims. And hitting, kicking, or beating was the most common type of incident category, and so covered 30% of claims. Some other ways that we can look at the uh, data is from the most common source of injury. So other ill worker was the most common source of injury category, followed by a healthcare patient or resident of healthcare facility. And this was 35% were the other worker and 31% were the uh, patient or resident. Sprains, strains, or tears occurred in occurred in 28% of these claims. And uh, workers aged 25 to 34 again had the most claims at 30%. And in this case, female workers had 62% of the claims compared to when we looked at just the general psychosocial hazard claims where it was evenly split between male and female. All right, now that we've looked at those statistics, we're going to look at some resources to support healthy and safe workplaces and help with uh, psychosocial hazard prevention. So I've got another quick poll. Has anyone here gone to the OHS resource portal? I've shared the poll, yes, no, or, or unsure. And if you have not been here, that's all right. We will also be sharing the link to this. Oh, and looks like we've got about 70% are saying yes, 30% no. All right, I'll leave that up and I'll explain what the portal is. So the OHS resource portal is our online portal where we have guides, e-learning modules, videos, fact sheets, fillable templates, and other tools. You can search this portal by your industry type, by the health and safety topic you're interested in, or even your audience type, whether you're an employer, a small business, a supervisor, a prime contractor, a worker, or a young worker. And on this screen, I, show, I wanted to show some of our most popular tools. So we have guides specific to employers. In the middle is our Occupational Health and Safety Starter Kit, which I'll highlight a bit later, but it is a great guide for the, everything that you would need to know to get your health and safety program off the ground or to add more to your existing health and safety program. And on the right hand side, you can see a, some screenshots of some Word documents. So these are some examples of some policies and procedure templates that you can download and use as a basis to build your own procedures and policies. As I said, I wanted to highlight this starter kit. So this is designed to help employers with smaller, or medium sized businesses develop a health and safety program from the ground up or strengthen their existing health and safety program, culture and performance. It gives information about key health and safety requirements that, that reply, uh, apply broadly across all industries. Also have tools available in other languages, including Ukrainian, French, Arabic, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Punjabi and Spanish. So these could be really helpful if you have some workers or coworkers who speak other languages. And the content for each language is growing, so be sure to check back every now and then to see what new resources might be available. I wanted to talk a little bit about the OHS Prevention Initiative. So this is an initiative that focuses on the three most common workplace injuries and illnesses that affect every workplace in Alberta. This includes injuries from slips, trips and falls, injuries to bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons, and nerves, so musculoskeletal disorders due to repetitive use, overexertion, and heavy lifting. And finally, injuries Ill and illnesses resulting from workplace violence, harassment, or mental health issues. So this is our psychosocial hazards piece, which is again what we've been talking about today.
as I said, so the prevention initiative has its own area of the OHS portal that specifically has some information on psychosocial hazards and prevention. So you can find some videos, you can find posters for your workplace and other tools. So this is an example on the right hand side of preventing psychosocial hazards in the workplace. And it talks a little bit about that hazard identification and assessment process that Yordanka mentioned. And it also has some links to some other guides to help with preventing psychosocial hazards in the workplace. Another one of the ways that we are working to address psychosocial hazards is through a grant funding program. So the Supporting Psychological Health in First Responders is also commonly called SPIFER. And it was established by the government of Alberta in response to the growing recognition of the mental health challenges faced by first responders. So Alberta's firefighters, police officers, paramedics, sheriffs, correction officers, and emergency workers who frequently encounter stressful, dangerous, and traumatic situations as part of their jobs, which leads to significantly higher rates of post-traumatic stress injuries compared to the general population. So in response, the SWIFER program was created to provide dedicated funding streams aimed at both delivering direct services and supporting research into effective prevention and intervention strategies for post-traumatic stress injuries among first responders. The SPIFER grant program has two streams. So there's a services stream, which are project-based grants for not-for-profit or public sector organizations. And the projects must provide services to Alberta first responders or emergency workers living with or who are at risk of post-traumatic stress injuries. And then the applied research stream is for research that develops and evaluates effective programs and services to support Alberta first responders or emergency workers living with or at risk of post-traumatic stress injuries. And I wanted, I'll, again, I'll be sharing some links for this information and the application uh, for this in case anybody online either works in an organization that could benefit from this grant or knows other people that could benefit. The next uh, intake should be in the spring, I believe. So just some statistics, we've had four cycles so far in the 2023 to 24 year. We received 31 applications, we funded 19 of them, and we had a total Total funding of $1.5 million. Most of the ones funded were on the services side, so 13, and then there was six applied research. We also post the results of the research projects on our open government portal, as well as some previous research funding for occupational health and safety. So if you are interested in those reports, you can also access them. And that brings us to almost the end of our presentation. So I wanted to leave you with a couple places to go if you have further OHS questions or concerns. First, you can go to ask an expert on alberta.ca. This is where you can fill out an online form to get feedback to your OHS questions, such as about legislation or about hazards. We also have where you can file a concern online. So if you have concerns about immediate danger or injury from work to you or to anyone else, then you can call the OHS contact center. You can report unhealthy or unsafe conditions at a workplace online or by phone, and you don't have to be a worker at that workplace to do so. You can also request to remain anonymous. Your call will go to the OHS Contact Center Advisors, and if you use the online method, then Occupational Health and Safety will acknowledge receipt of any online concerns via email within three business days. Follow-up actions by Occupational Health and Safety depends on the nature of the concern and the number of concerns that are being processed. So with that, oh, and I wanted to ask one more question. Now that we've reflected on this, I'm gonna launch a poll question again. So you remember at the beginning, we asked if there were any uncontrolled psychosocial hazards in your workplace. And now that we've gone over this, what is your, your view? I see when we first did this question, about 28 people said they were unsure, and now that has dropped down to 6%. And it looks like we have more people saying yes, so hopefully this has helped you reflect. So as we come to the end of this workshop, I do want you to reflect on your current workplace. What psychosocial hazards exist in your workplace? Are they controlled? Are there some barriers that are preventing your workplace from addressing them? And do you need some strategies to help control or eliminate these hazards. As I said, we will be sharing out the uh, some links for some of our resources that you can bring back to your workplace. And I'll also be again sharing the links for the contact center and 
the Ask an Expert so that if you want to uh, talk to somebody about that, then hopefully they can provide more specific feedback on your workplace.